The Sky This Month with your host, Dave McDonald. Welcome to The Sky This Month. I'm your host, Dave McDonald, and we are from home looking at the end of April and through May to some degree. So uh, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. The actual date's April 24th. And uh, I have some students who are gonna be sharing with you about that. Just as a little bit of a preview, if you're able to catch the Lyrid meteor shower, which peaks the morning, like between midnight and dawn on April 22nd, April 23rd, April 24th, uh, that may be a treat for you. And the radiant is in the constellation of Lyra or Lyra, the harp. And Vega is the brightest star that rules the summer sky. And Vega is going to be rising around 10 o'clock. It should be up. And that is going to be towards the radiant. However, you can look anywhere in the sky after midnight before dawn, April 22, 23, 24. And you should see some Lyrid meteors. One of the, uh, the neat things about meteor showers is, uh, you know, they're unexpected. They, they could be very strong or they might be weak, but in any case, get a chance to enjoy that. Speaking of meteor showers, May 5th is the peak of the Eta Aquirid meteor shower. And the neat thing about the Eta Aquirid meteor shower is that you are looking at debris. If you see any meteors go through the sky, you are actually looking at the debris left over from Halley's Comet. And uh, the Lyrid meteor, sorry, the Eta Aquirid meteor shower uh, peaks between midnight and dawn on May 5th. But again, a couple days either side of that should be just fine. Um, more things to tell you about at uh, towards the end of the show. I'll share with you some other neat things about the planets in the morning, in the evening, some conjunctions coming up. Uh, but first, I would like us to continue with the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, I have some special guests that I'm going to introduce to you. Well, I have a special treat for you. I have uh, four students from Belmont High School. They are the Astronomy Club officers. And we are going to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. And so... Uh, this is the group that is going to be uh, sharing. So there's myself in the middle. Uh, Seth is on your left, Cody on your right, bottom left is Dylan, and bottom right is Adam. And uh, we're going to be, they're going to be talking about their favorite Hubble uh, images and telling you a little bit uh, about them. Okay, so uh, Cody, you're up first. All right, thank you. So I, I know I was on here uh, talking about Hubble last month on the show, um, but I've got a few more images I'd like to share. So this is uh, called the Southern Crab Nebula. I know I talked about the Crab Nebula last month, um, but this is a similar looking nebula that you find in the southern sky in Centaurus. Um, so unfortunately for those of us watching here in the United States, um, you very likely will not be able to see that. Um, but what I thought was interesting about this is you can see all the little trails um, coming off of it, uh, off of the nebula here. Um, and what that is, is that's where uh, matter is actually escaping from the nebula. Um, and it's escaping out into space. So that's what forms a sort of legs and it looks like a crab. Um, next picture I'd like to talk about uh, is the bubble nebula. This is one that you can see, it's closer to home. Uh, it's located in Cassiopeia. So if you look up in the sky and you see the constellation that's shaped like an M or a W, uh, that's Cassiopeia the Queen. Um, and this one, I think, is very unique in the sense that it does look like a bubble from our perspective. It almost looks like you got something like when you see like the orange in the center of the screen here. It almost looks like there's something um, trapped inside the bubble. Uh, to me, it's just impressive that for these objects, they're so far away. For example, this one's 7,100 light years away. Um, that Hubble is able to take just such clear pictures of it. And I think that the fact that these pictures still stand up, like st have stood the test of time 30 years later, I think is still very impressive. 
Uh, it's funny because, you know, at first there was a bit of a mathematical error um, in the Hubble and it had to be corrected. Um, but now that it has been corrected, uh, I think we're all fortunate that we can see these images of deep space with such clarity. Uh, and the last image I want to talk about here, <laughs> it's called NGC 1015. So this is a um, spiral galaxy of sorts, very likely a supermassive black hole in the center of it. Um, and honestly, this one I kind of uh, chose just for the fact that it, it looks cool. Because sometimes, you know, especially in a time like this where we're all isolated, one thing that we do have our, at our disposal is the night sky. Nice. Um, you can go outside. You can look at the night sky while still social distancing. Um, and I think it's important to remember that. So what I thought looked cool about this is um, it kind of, uh, kind of reminds me of the last scene of Empire Strikes Back like where Luke and Leia are looking out like into space and they see this big galaxy like shape in front of them. Um, it, you know, it's also important again, in a time like this to have some fun and, you know, be able to connect science and science fiction uh, because it's always fun to dream. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I got for you for images. Well, cool. I think uh, that's awesome. And uh, so that was uh, Cody sharing his images. And so next we're going to uh, hear from Seth. So the images I've selected from Hubble to kind of focus on are uh, related to quasars. Um, their quasars are pretty, I'm pretty fascinated by them. They're really cool. Um, so this is an image of the galaxy Markarian 231. Um, it's about 600 million light years away. It's pretty far. Um, but it's a it's a relatively clear image for something that's so far away and what you can see in the center of this image is a very bright pinpoint um and that is a quasar um and you can they can also be referred to as uh active galactic nuclei or agn um and they're super massive black holes um that are feeding so they have an accretion disk around them that's very bright um, and because of the magnetic environment, they also emit jets of radiation um, on either side, kind of like that. Um, and they're so bright, in fact, that we can detect these from Earth, the radiation. And um, this, despite the fact that it's 600 million light years away, this is the closest quasar to Earth uh, that we can observe. Oh. And um, depending on how we look at a quasar, it can have a different name. Um, those jets of radiation that I mentioned, if they happen to be angled so that they're pointing at Earth, uh, we call that a blazar or a pulsar. And um, these objects rotate. Um, so when they're pointing at Earth and it's rotating and spinning around very quickly, we see it as like a blip. It pulses very, uh, in a very accurate period. Um, and it's almost like a clock. Uh, they they pull so accurately and so consistently that you can almost use it as a method of, of keeping time, um, which is really interesting to me as well. Um, and on the same subject, this is a like a mosaic of images of quasars. And what's really cool about these is they're, uh, they're a phenomenon called gravitational lensing. So in all these images, you can kind of see uh, distinct uh, bright spots. It's a little fuzzy, but you can definitely make it out. Um, and what this appears like at first is like multiple quasars that are very close together. But what's actually going on here is, is the same quasar is being mirrored, uh, or what's called gravitationally lensed, uh, by a foreground object with a lot of mass. So the one that's of particular interest to me is in the top middle. Um, WGD that one um, it looks like it's four like identical quasars in a, like a perfect circle which is just very interesting to look at um, and that's an example of like a, a quadruple uh, mirroring of a single quasar which is just it's very uncommon because it requires a very precise alignment of a foreground galaxy or cluster and the background quasar so it d does not happen very often Nice. Um, and so the, the third image is an illustration of how this happens. So uh, we have a quasar in the background, and then in between our observation from Earth and the quasar in the back, we have a foreground galaxy. Um, and 
that the gravity from that object is distorting the quasar in the back and causing us to see it multiple times. Um, and it can affect the size and brightness of the quasar. So some quasars that are being gravitationally lensed appear to be extremely bright and extremely large, um, more so than they actually are. Um, and the reason I thought this was important and kind of cool to talk about is uh, the relevance it has to dark matter. Um, dark matter is something that's very, uh, there's a lot that's not known about it. It's something we're learning about as we go on. And um, uh, gravitationally lensed galaxies and quasars uh, can tell us a little bit about dark matter. It can allow us to measure uh, dark matter uh, by seeing the amount uh, that these objects are being distorted uh, by gravity. We can measure uh, the dark matter itself, which is exceptionally interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and that's what I have for the Hubble images. Well, awesome. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Of course. Uh, that. All right. So it's going to be Adam's turn to share what uh, you have for us. So take it away, Adam. So the first image I got here that Hubble took is of the trapezium cluster, which is inside the Orion Nebula, obviously in the constellation of Orion. And uh, what you can see here on the left is a visible light picture of it, and on the right, an infrared light picture. I noticed in the infrared, you can see the actual stars a lot better, but in the visible, you can kind of see the nebula better. And the, uh, the reason this happens is that the stars are lighting up the gas and dust inside the nebula, kind of the way that a fluorescent lamp would work. And this is a very like active star forming area. It's an open cluster, so it's pretty new. And uh, the five brightest stars pictured in the right, you can see pretty easily, are about 15 to 30 solar masses in size. So they're pretty big and they're pretty bright. And this is definitely something that you can look at like with binoculars or an entry level telescope or anything, it's very cool to look at. Nice. Some more information if you want to look. But the next thing I thought was pretty interesting is that Hubble is actually kind of used to keep track, like keep tabs on uh, Uranus and Neptune, because the last thing to visit them was the Voyagers back in the 80s. And uh, since we haven't had anything near them, the best way to look at them is with a really big telescope. So Hubble's been doing that. Um, some general information is Neptune is the smallest gas giant and has six faint rings while Uranus has 13 rings around it. And the reason they're not quite as visible as say Saturn's because they're made out of dust so they don't reflect light nearly as well. My final image that Hubble took is uh, of the Sombrero galaxy. I think it's just a really beautiful image. Um, it's a barred spiral type of galaxy which it's interesting to me because I thought it looked more like an elliptical myself, but that is the actual classification of it because it just is uh, said to have a really large central bulge and be a spiral for like the dust that you can see in like a flat plane. Um, it has a diameter of 50,000 light years and uh, in the center there's a lot more of younger stars than they would expect and the outer area there's a lot of dust and gas that hasn't yet formed stars. Cool, thank you, Adam. And then uh, Dylan is up with uh, your selections. Go ahead, Dylan. All right, so it's the third, uh, it marks the 30th uh, anniversary of the Hubble telescope, uh, but this is actually one of the, like, the most classic images taken by the Hubble telescope. Yeah. It's actually, this year marks the 25th anniversary um, of the original 1995 Hubble uh, image of the Eagle Nebula's Pillars of Creation. And um, the more updated image, uh, they revisited in 2014 um, for a couple reasons. Uh, the original image wasn't finished uh, in the top right corner. Uh, and this has to do with um, the technology they had available to them at the time. Uh, the instrument was, the image itself was taken in visible light, not uh, infrared. So. The thing that infrared does for the image is it cancels out a lot of the dust that surrounds the pillars. It makes it a lot more, um, a lot more vibrant of an image. It, it eliminates some of like the, uh, the haziness of it. And also it helped finish the, uh, the top right corner there. Um, interesting fact about the uh, pillars of this image. They're about five light years uh, tall. 
which is very, very, very tall, very long. Um, and the, the, the reason why uh, there was so much interference with the original image is just above uh, the pillars, there is uh, a group of young massive stars that um, cast a lot of light down into the image and the infrared um, has the ability to cancel that light out. And, uh, and also within the pillars of this, of, of Eagle Nebula, um, there are also stars being born every day, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, my next image is the Medusa merger. Um, the Medusa the merger was, uh, was, not, was not always one entity, uh, but two. Um, it was an early galaxy consumed by a smaller gas rich system and it threw out um, streams of stars and dust into space. And um, this image is also referred to as the eye of Medusa um, because uh, the, the brighter part in the center, uh, it said, you know, if you look like the, the legend of Medusa is if you look into the eyes of Medusa, you turn to stone. Mm. And um, uh, the streams that you see like kind of on the outer edges of the image, um, the blue streams, those are supposed to be like the hair strands that Medusa had. Yeah, I just, I picked this image because I thought it was pretty cool. And the last image I chose was of Jupiter and uh, its red spot. Uh, Jupiter is the largest planet in our, in our solar system. And it's also home to the largest known uh, storm in our solar system as well, which is the great red spot. And uh, this is actually an updated portrait of Jupiter that Hubble took uh, just last year, uh, June 27, 2019. Um, and I think it's a great image. Uh, it really depicts um, the turbulent winds and atmosphere of the planet. Uh, all those stripes that you see, um, those different uh, layers of the planet, they're moving in different directions. Uh, and yeah, it's just a great image. And that's all I have for uh, the Hubble images. Yeah, it's amazing when you when you look at uh, a picture of Jupiter like that. It almost looks like it's got to be some type of a spacecraft orbiting Jupiter. But you know, here we are. Basically, the Hubble Space Telescope is only 400 miles above Earth, and yeah. all that distance being able to get that uh, clarity is uh, it's crazy. Incredible. Uh, so, Dylan, would you be willing to to go first with the the next piece on the uh, night sky. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, so that, I think that'll work out timing for you. And so what we're uh, going to be doing is sharing a little bit about what's going on in the night sky for the end of April and the beginning of uh, May. So this is uh, pretty close to today's date, um, more towards the end of April. Um, uh, but this is just an image I found uh, where it shows that if you look due west uh, at 9 p.m. Uh, April 19th, um, which is this coming Monday, uh, or sorry, this coming Sunday, um, Venus and the six stars of the winter hexagon uh, should be just above the horizon line. And uh, that's a pretty cool image right there. So that's all I have for that. And they show up uh, pretty nicely. You can almost like just pick it out as being a hexagon. And it's kind of cool that Venus is there too. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you, Dylan. And then um, I think, uh, Seth, if you, if you would yep. go, go next and talk about what you have cooking in the night sky for us. Yes, will do. These are some uh, shots from Stellarium. And uh, what this just shows is um, the moon and Venus uh, nearing. They're going to be very close to each other towards the end of the month. These are on the dates April 25th and 26th. Uh, 25th is on the right, and the, or sorry, the 25th is on the left, and the 26th is on the right. Um, and what I find just interesting about this is just it makes it very easy to uh, observe both of these objects um, because they're so close to each other and uh, it's just cool. That's <laughs> uh, I'm being honest with you is uh, my main interest in it. I think whenever there's a conjunction of objects, it's a great opportunity to view 
uh, a lot of celestial objects at once. Um, and it's just a great opportunity uh, and to just go out and take a look. And that's, that's what I have for that. Good. That's, that's cool. So that's uh, April 25th and 26th. Yep. And uh, uh, Venus, like all the planets, they follow a path called the ecliptic. They stay really close to the line, which the ecliptic is the, basically the pathway of, uh, of the sun. And so Venus is close by and the moon also follows close to the ecliptic within five degrees. And uh, so you find the moon passing the planets quite often. All right. Oh, all right. Well, thank you for, for that, Seth. Of course. And uh, for some reason, uh, you were talking, Seth, but Dylan's picture was on my screen anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it was kind of cool because it looked like you were talking, Dylan. All right. <laughs> so uh, up next with our night sky is, uh, is Adam. What do you have for us, Adam? So I have a uh, planetary lining up sort of there's not really a specific day for this one but just throughout the month and it does get better later in the month better meaning higher in the sky um sort of east southeast sort of that way you can see mars and jupiter before the sun comes up in the morning so you gotta you gotta want to get up early and see this one there's not like not any easy way to avoid that but throughout the month they get higher up in the sky and it's nice to see uh two very interesting things to look at, Mars and Jupiter. Mars, when you look at it through a telescope, you can clearly see that it's red and you can see a little disc to it. And Jupiter is really spectacular. That's probably my favorite planet to look at. You can see some of the bands on the planet itself, as well as some of the four Galilean moons. And so for people who like to get up early in the morning and go out for a walk, a jog, or a run or something, uh, there's some things to to look at and to enjoy in the morning sky in the in the southeast. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. So uh, thank you guys. Thought that was really interesting. It was nice to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. The actual date <clears throat> is April 24th, and uh, then we got to see some of the neat things that are happening in the late April, early May sky. So, uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for uh, for joining us, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. you too. You too. Thank you. Well, I hope that you really enjoyed that with the guys talking about the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope as well. Some of the neat things going on in the sky. I'd like to extend and talk a little bit more about what's going on in the night sky. So let me just uh, take a quick moment and bring up uh, the night sky so that uh, everybody can see that. All righty. So um, what we're looking at here <clears throat> is May 1st, 9 o'clock. But it is true that basically the stars that you see are visible the last week in April, the first couple weeks in May towards the southeast and, and higher. The thing that's just special about May 1st is the moon and where the moon is. So here's the Big Dipper that I'm circling, part of Ursa Major. And you notice that the handle of the Big Dipper, and the Big Dipper will be up high, 9 o'clock. And you can find that. Find the handle of the Big Dipper. Notice that it arcs, and it arcs to a star called Arcturus. It's a magnitude zero star. And if we keep on going, we arc to Arcturus and then spike down towards the horizon to a star called Spica, a magnitude one star. Bluish white star. Arcturus is orange reddish star and then over here we have the moon and this is special again for may 1st the moon will be moving more towards the east about 13 degrees a night but this is hanging out by the sickle of leo here this is leo the lion this is the star regulus and this is the hind haunches of the uh the lion so maybe you'll see it a little better if i uh bring up the lines here and now you can see this backwards question mark or the sickle of leo the moon is near that star regulus then again just to review we arc to arcturus and spike down to spica 
Arcturus is the brightest star in the constellation of Buotes, and to me, it, it looks like an ice cream cone. Officially, it's the charioteer, but look at this. Here's Arcturus, and it kind of makes this ice cream cone coming up where this is the top. Maybe we have a cherry here. Off to the left is Corona Borealis. It kind of maybe looks like a dollop of whipped cream fell off. This is the northern crown. So those are some neat things that you can be looking for in the night sky. And remember to keep in mind that you have the Lyrid meteor shower between midnight and dawn on April 22, 23, 24. Then May 5th is the Eta Aquarid meteor shower where you get to see debris left over from Halley's Comet. And every morning you'll see some awesome things in the eastern sky. You have the planet Mars, Saturn, Jupiter is the brightest one shining negative 2.3 magnitude. And then in the evening sky, brilliant Venus at negative 4.7. You can't miss Venus. And then I'll be talking more next month about uh, Mercury joining Venus for a conjunction around May 21st. So um, I hope that you enjoyed the show, that you enjoyed seeing the guys talk about the neat things that are happening in the night sky. and without so many jets up in the air, without so many cars on the road, the sky is really kind of nice and clear and crisp when it's clear up. So I hope that you enjoyed the show. I'm Dave McDonald, The Sky This Month.